Hello, my name is Cindy Kautz, and I'm here today with fellow committee members who have been researching Muscatine women from the past century. Our project name is Muscatine Women of Influence and Inspiration. We've had fun learning about these women and the contributions that may, they made to our community. This project was developed to commemorate in the year 2020, the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. This amendment gave women the right to vote. Uh, because we are uh, of the current pandemic, we are taping from our homes today uh, with the help of Chad Bishop from the MCC studio. Uh, we have chosen to social distance at this time following the CDC guidelines to prevent the spread of COVID-19 virus. The writers will now share the stories of the women they researched and their contributions to Muscatine. We don't know if they were suffragists, but they certainly chose independent paths. Our panel today uh, of writers is Jean Clark and Sharon Savage. I would like to now introduce Jean. Hello. I researched Catherine Miller and she was a global citizen, a progressive educator and a social activist. To honor her, the Stanley Center on Peace and Security established the Catherine Miller Explorer Award, which is given out every year. She was born in 1908 in Storm Lake, Iowa. And if we'd go to the next slide, we can see pictures of her in her high school and college days. She studied at the University of Iowa and then she taught there from 1930 to 1940. In 1942, she came to Muscatine High School and later taught at the community college. She taught from 1942 to 1974, and she taught both Spanish and French. She was fluent in both. Um, if we look at the next slide, we'll see an example of how she spent her summers she, it was a combination of social activism and international travel. She did coursework in France, as you can see here, she studied at the Sorbonne. And she also worked at Quaker public health work camps in Mexico. She would organize her students to learn from and assist residents of the migrant camps here in Muscatine. She was always busy during the summers and on the next slide, we'll see an envelope that is just has notes absolutely all over it. And this is classic Catherine. She was always busy planning and organizing. She'd scribble her thoughts down. Sometimes they were in Spanish, sometimes English, sometimes French. During her summer travel, she also went to all, she went to three world fairs. And in the next slide, we'll see uh, a map from one of them. And she also did a lot of traveling. She traveled in over 40 countries. And she received a Ford Foundation Fellowship for Creative Teaching in 1952 to 53. And she was one of two teachers in the whole United States selected for this. And she visited schools and social work programs in Latin America. So she traveled all over Latin America for the whole school year. In the next slide, we'll see a picture of her in Peru. She was in 18 Latin American countries. And this traveling went on for eight months. She went in and out of 45 different airports in the early 1950s as a single woman. And if we look at the next picture, where she, a picture from Ecuador, she was in Peru, Colombia, and Chile for six weeks each, and then Brazil and Uruguay for four weeks each, and then other countries for maybe not quite as so long. Next photo shows 
of street scene from Bolivia. And she, one of the things I knew Catherine in her older years, and one of the things she told me about was being in Brazil. And I don't have a photo for this, but she had gone to a concert and heard about a boat that was going up the Amazon. And in an hour, if she could be at the docks, she could catch a ride up the Amazon. She did it. And she said after she was on the boat and they were chugging up, she realized that she was the only woman on the boat and that um, so she had to dine with the captain and it was quite an adventure. She also, one of the reasons she got this um, grant for creative teaching is she always involved her students in activities around culture and food. And on the next slide, we'll see a picture of that was in the newspaper of her annual Pan American Fiesta, where the kids would um, decorate the gymnasium and they would serve um, food from the various countries in South and Central America, and they would do entertainment. And in the next slide, we'll see part of the newspaper write up. And if you can see it closely, you might see some people that you would recognize or knew about. Um, she taught both Dick and Mary Jo Stanley, and in fact, introduced them to each other. And um, she was a fabulous educator. In the next slide, we'll see a picture of her with her early audio equipment. She had an audio lab for teaching and was a very early adapter of audio technology. And in the next photo, we'll see that she was also involved in various local and state offices in different education organizations. And she traveled all over the state for education meetings, but she didn't have a car and didn't drive. In the next photo, we'll see where she talked about, she learned to drive when she was 50 years old and she got this little car and right away drove up to Quebec for the World's Fair. Um, in our next photo, we'll see a plaque that um, just is at City Hall in honor of the tree planting ceremony that she organized in 1955, commemorating the 10th anniversary of the starting of the United Nations. She was an outspoken advocate for the United Nations, for civil rights, for women's equality, and for peace and justice issues. In our next photo, I uh, was able to find from school yearbooks, um, pictures of Catherine in 1968 during the Vietnam War moratorium. She was with college students down at City Hall and she was always writing letters to the editor, and we'll see that in our next slide, and petitions to Congress, letters to legislators. I'm sure she was just a, a burr in the saddle of a lot of public officials because she was writing them all the time. And she, she would also write on newspaper clippings. In our next photo, you can see the kind of things that she would send to us. You know, as a teacher, she would send me articles with little notes on them, urging, urging me to, um, and other women. She did this to I, multiple women in this community, sending us clippings and then urging us to educate ourselves and be more active and to, to get involved in social issues or to use materials like this in our classroom to help broaden students' perspective of the world. She'd tape radio shows that she listened because in her uh, senior years, she lived by herself, but she'd tape radio shows and then she'd give you a 
a copy of the tape, you know, because she knew that you were busy during the day and hadn't been able to listen to it. Uh, she was just always had an outlook of activism and concern for global issues. In the next slide, we'll see some of the organizations that she was involved in. The one that surprised me was when she told me she was a World War II enemy plane spotter. Uh, she would go up on Mark Twain Overlook. This was during World War II and they had people assigned 24 seven to stay up there and watch for enemy planes in case they would try to bomb the dams along the river. Uh, she was also, as you can see, I talked about her public health work in Mexico and organizing students. She was on the mayor's UN committee. She raised money for UNICEF by selling cards. Uh, she did that multiple years. She'd have a little table out at the community college or at a hy V or somewhere like that. Uh, she was a founding member of Muscatine's League of Women Voters Organization and uh, Muscatine World Federalists and the Muscatine Sister Cities Organization. She then was also involved in um, AAUW, American Association of University Women, United Nations Association, Musser Public Library Board, various education organizations, Muscatine County Migrant Ministry. If we go to the next slide, we'll see this was a picture of Catherine's uh, door into the side of the house in the kitchen. And, you know, she had stickers from all kinds of organizations. And this was just how she, how she lived her life being involved in activities. And on the next slide, we'll see that she received the 2004 um, City of Muscatine Lifetime Humanitarian Award. It was the first time it had ever been given, and I think it's only been given twice so far. And on the next show, on the next slide, we'll see um, Catherine, her, these were her words when she graduated from junior college. And I think these early words from 1928 express her outlook and her view of life already. And it says, what have we given the school? The promise of a more useful life, the promise to make the most of our possibilities in service. The indebtedness of two years here is not alone to the banker or to the teachers. It is to the whole world. That obligation that comes of opportunity, that realization that privilege is responsibility. And in the next slide, we'll see the ending of it. She says, I wish I could, um, I could wish you no greater happiness, could give you no greater commission than this, that you go out in the spirit of one at another last supper, go with a smile on your lips, a song and a prayer in your heart to live well, to laugh often, to love much and to give everything. And as we can see the next two slides, we have some pictures of Catherine from various yearbooks as she was teaching. She was always giving and always trying to encourage other people and especially young women in the community of Muscatine. So Catherine Miller is someone we all could emulate. Thank you. And our next person. Please introduce her. You want me to? Okay. Our, our next person is Sharon Savage. And she'll tell us who she's talking about. Hi, I'm Sharon Savage. And I uh, am, uh, wrote about Cora Weed who uh, lived from 1844 to 1910. Uh, she was born in Quincy, Illinois, and she moved to Muscatine when she with, with her family when she was about five years old. Her father was a riverboat engineer, and uh, an interesting thing is that his name was Charles Chaplin, or Charlie Chaplin, not the, not the one we know about, though. Uh, if we look at the next slide, 
uh, you will see that she was a member of the Congregational Church from childhood. She focused her education on the learning of German and French. Uh, she was also one of a group of Muscatine women that signed a petition indicating that they would replace the clerks of the local businesses uh, so that the clerks could enlist in the military in the support of the Civil War effort. They donated their salaries to the soldiers. And the reason that they did that was because the clerks made more money than the soldiers did, which uh, is kind of interesting, too. Um, so she progressed to being a teacher and a principal uh, in the Muscatine school system. In the next slide, you can see that that uh, she married Chester Reed um, and, and on July 31st, 1873. And you can see a picture there of, of Cora and Chester on their honeymoon in Paris. Uh, Chester was 54 at the time of their marriage and Cora was 29. So there was a very broad age difference between the two of them. On the next slide, you'll see a picture of Chester. Uh, he was a very successful local business leader. Uh, his father was a man named Dr. Benjamin Weed and he was a physician in Muscatine for many years. So Chester was trained at Yale for one year in the study of medicine, but decided that he was not interested in practicing medicine and so moved on to other things, other business um, endeavors. You'll see on the next slide that uh, he received instruction in art in Boston. He bought a camera obscura and was in the daguerreotype business. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's a process where you create photos on um, metal plates using lots of chemicals and lots of acids. So he had a, a uh, business both in Iowa City uh, prior to 1841 and also in Muscatine. He bought a farm on the west side of Park Avenue where he raised horses. He operated a general mercantile business. He was the first president of the Muscatine Gas Company and was the president of the Muscatine branch of the Bank of Iowa, which became a Muscatine National Bank. Uh, he represented several insurance companies, began a pork packing business, and was at one time the owner of the commercial hotel and had an interest in the Muscatine Mills. So Chester was a very successful and well-to-do businessman in the community. The next picture shows you um, a photo of the home in which Chester and Cora live, and that's on the corner of Lynn uh, and 2nd Street, and that still is there today. However, if you'll see, as you see on the next side, a lot of, of heartbreak uh, occurred in, in the life of Cora. On December 7th, uh, at the age of 55, about a year and a half after their marriage, Chester took poison and committed suicide. And there has been a, a lot of discussion in the community about what exactly happened. Uh, it's interesting to note that a lot of the material about this incident it does not occur in the Muscatine papers, but it is in the Davenport papers. And what they what is stated is that a short time before his death at 6 p.m. in his home, he stated that he had committed suicide by taking poison. It is reported that he seemed troubled and worried for weeks, laboring at times under mental excitement and being depressed in spirits. He was nervous his last evening, according to Cora, and excited all night. He, he went from uh, periods of time where he was very elated and excited and very depressed and very tired and very down. Uh, she said that last night he got up at frequent intervals and complained of suffering considerably. So she called a neighbor and she called a doctor. And meanwhile, Chester had several spasms and died. Uh, and if we look at his behavior, it sounds a great deal like what we would call manic depression today. Uh, but of course, um, it would be impossible to make a diagnosis just to know that he went through a very difficult uh, last period of life <laughs> in the home of Cora. Uh, so um, if we look at the next PowerPoint, you can see that Cora um, used this incident. Uh, and also, uh, as you'll see in a future PowerPoint, she had a, a child die at uh, infancy. Uh, but she took these, these uh, life issues and tried to make something out of her life. She was the founder and president of the Fort 
Nightly Club, which is, was the first strictly literary club to be organized in Muscatine in 1881. And the meeting place uh, was being at the residence of, of Mrs. Weed. She was a member of the Daughters of the American Revolution. She was instrumental in the organization and success of the Muscatine uh, Musical Union Orchestra. Uh, she was vice president of the Old Settler Society in Muscatine County, and she also gave, gave lessons in French and German. The next picture shows her home, uh, which is uh, just an astounding place. It was called Erie, and that means Eagle's Nest. And uh, the Fortnightly Club was organized, meetings held from 1891 until 1905 when it was sold for Bellevue Hospital. Uh, it also states in the research uh, that she was interested in having a large home because she wanted to have gatherings and community events. Many Muscatine people were born here in this uh, particular home because it turned into Bellevue Hospital. Uh, so, but this beautiful building still stands today and it's a private home that has been restored. If you look at the next slide, you'll see at the very top is the picture of Bellevue Hospital, early Bellevue Hospital. And in the center is a picture of Cora's home. You can see that it stands on a bluff that overlooks the Mississippi River. Uh, look at the little tower on top. Uh, that has an area where you can go up there and, and see across the river and, and see all kinds of beautiful, beautiful scenery in the area. Uh, the next picture shows you Cora's uh, niece, Gina Nichols Cook, and she's standing uh, by the front entrance of that home. Uh, and as I said, that has been restored uh, to, to, to look a great deal like that today. On the next uh, slide, you will see the inside of the home. And I'm showing you several pictures of the inside of the home because I find it terribly interesting. Uh, I think that we learn a lot about a person uh, when, we, when we look at what they surround themselves with. And if we look at her home there, you can see all kinds of things, instruments, lots of instruments. Uh, and she was a very musical lady and of course, lots of artwork. Uh, at the baskets, if you can see the basket there, and you'll in the other next pictures, you'll see baskets hanging from the ceilings. And it looks like they're baskets of flowers. And perhaps they've used those for fragrance. You know, we buy our scented candles today. Uh, and perhaps uh, that was just used to, to make the room smell wonderful in those days. Uh, you can, uh, there's another picture, another picture of the inside of the home. Uh, and, and, uh, and you can see her piano there. And there's another one of those baskets that appears to contain flowers. And look at all the pictures and the artwork. What a beautiful place. Uh, so uh, we can also see in the next uh, PowerPoint that in 1903, Cora was the president of the City Federation of Women's Clubs, which participated in the child labor law movement to influence the state legislature to make compulsory education laws and to prohibit child labor, as most people in this community are aware, the button industry had a great deal of child labor occurring. And so she tried to take efforts to make sure that children got an education in the school system and didn't uh, have to uh, work until they were a little bit older. As president of the women's club, uh, excuse me, as president of the club, she worked on the establishment of women's restrooms in the YMCA on the edge of the business district providing a place for women to gather when accompanying their husbands to the city. Unlike today, there were not places where women could visit while their husbands were in town. There weren't, and now of course there, there, there are restaurants that women go to or perhaps the library or, or wherever. Those didn't occur at those times. Women were not uh, uh, privileged to be able to go into places very well on their own. So Cora tried to set up restrooms not as we identify today, but as places where women could gather and have lunch, socialize with other, have some coffee or tea in a safe and comfortable environment. If you look at the next slide, one of the things that Cora was involved in that actually caused some stress for Cora, uh, in, in 1986, she became a member of the Iowa Monument Commission and built that the commission built the Iowa Soldiers and Sailors Monument in Des Moines. And you can see a picture of it there. The, what, what caused problems uh, for, for Sarah is, is in the next slide. And this is the Iowa figure. Uh, this is the, the figure that represents Iowa. 
this is an allegorical figure that represents our young and vigorous state as a beautiful, youthful mother offering nourishment to her children. The statue created a great deal of conflict in the state Senate over the nudity uh, in the figure. The senators, some senators, not all of them, opposed the so-called exposure, but they were outvoted by the others. They said that the people of Iowa would be shocked by such a display, but Cora Weed thought it was just fine and perfectly proper. I don't know, ladies, what do you think? It's an interesting, <laughs> I would not want it in my backyard, but it's in Des Moines uh, to this day. Uh, if you look at the next slide, you will see that uh, Cora also wrote something called the Iowa Soldiers and Sail Sailors Monument. In 1898, she compiled and published the handbook of the monument. In that book, she has pictures of all photos of the, all the different soldiers and sailors, and she has descriptions of them also. This book is out of print now, but it is available for viewing in the Mustard Public Library. There is a conference, excuse me, there is a copy in the reference section of, of uh, Mustard Public Library. On the last slide, you will see that Cora eventually moved to a smaller home. She loaned or left many of her works of art at the, to the Musser Library. On July 27th in 1910, Cora was sitting on her porch, which was directly opposite Washington School. A painter was painting the school tower and fell 60 feet to the pavement. Cora saw him fall and heard him scream. She fainted and lapsed into nervous prostration uh, caused by the shock. She died shortly thereafter on August 2nd, 1910. So as you can see, Cora had a very interesting life with a great many tragedies, a great many tragedies. Uh, this is the end of my section and Jean Clark will present the Anna Sanchez section next. Sebastiana or Anna Sanchez was born in 1875 and died in 1959. She lived 84 years and was possibly the first Mexican woman to immigrate to Muscatine. In the next photo, we'll see from, it's a map of Iowa from the Iowa Women's Archives. And it shows in the 1900 census uh, that there were 29 Mexicans in all of Iowa. And there are dots there kind of showing where people lived that were from Mexico. The larger dots, I looked at those and those tend to be um, some miscalculations and it's maybe someone who had traveled to Mexico, but they weren't really um, Mexicans that were here. There were only 29 in the entire state in 1900. But we'll see in the next photo that the Muscatine Journal tells about Mexicans are being um, employed now to work on the Rock Island line. They were doing an experiment. They wanted to try substituting Mexicans for Italians. And they were had hired 300 single Mexican men railroad workers. And they these men then lived in boarding cars and were moved up and down the line wherever they were needed. So most of the people coming were single men and they were just living transiently in these box cars. If you look at the next photo, we'll see that in the 1910 Muscatine census, her family um, consisting of her husband, John, and her three children and six single male men um, all lived together. And there's an X off to the side where there would be a, a number for on the street. And that's because they were living most likely, um, as reported later in the newspaper, in a box car. So can you imagine living with your three kids and six other men who are working on the railroad and are traveling in and out so Anna's coming was kind of an anomaly because there aren't any other um, families or even women listed in the area at that point. Um, so for her to come was a big step. And we have 
at first I thought, oh, I'm not going to find anything else. And by the magic of the internet, I was able to connect with a great, great, great granddaughter who lives in Oklahoma, who um, had information that I found through Ancestry.com. And Anna or Sebastiana told her life story to her granddaughter and it was written down. And it's an amazing story. This woman lived through um, a lot of heartache and she was born January 20th, 1875 in the Chiricahua mountains. She was Apache and her father told her when she was very, very young, he was going to, um, he was going out to fight to defend their, their land. And he said, if he didn't come back, she should go to the mission. And so that's what happened. He didn't return. She goes to the local mission. There she is adopted by a Spanish family when she's eight years old. And then her mother dies when she, her adopted mother dies when she's 16 and her stepfather is so bereft that she um, decides he decides that he really can't handle um, having raising her anymore. And so she is adopted by her stepmother's um, brother. And so she is adopted twice at the ages of eight and at 16. She eventually marries and has two children and they're named Stella, who was born in 1898 and Jose, who was born 1901 or 1902. We get different references, um, but her husband dies in 1901. So either she just had a new baby or else she was pregnant with her second child when her husband died. and. At, when he dies, then she goes to live at the monastery. In the next photo, we should be able to see um, a, yeah, a picture. She went by the name of Rose Littleheart, is what her family called her for her native name. In 1906, she was kidnapped without her children by Juan Tomas Contreras Sanchez. She was working at the monastery. She answered the door and a fellow who was deserting from the Mexican army uh, was there and that was Juan Sanchez. And he stayed at the monastery for a little bit. And when he was moving on, he said he was going to um, cross the Rio Grande and go to the United States. And when he left, he just got on his horse, went, galloping along and swooped up Anna, who was out on the streets walking to pick up her daughter from school and just scooped her up and took her away and said, you know, I want you for my wife and I'm going to have you whether you marry me or not. And she ended up, um, they got married in the next town, which was in early May of 1906. She had a son, Benjamin, born February 13th, 1907, and he was born in what is now Arizona. It's still the area um, that wasn't part of the United States yet. So he's, um, she was always pleading with her husband to let her go back and get her two children because when he took her, you know, it was just her on the horse with him. And... He was afraid that if he let her go back to get his kids, that she wouldn't return. But somehow they're reunited. She's reunited with her children because in the 1910 census, her two older children by her previous husband are living there with them. And in the next slide, we'll see that the Sanchez's are living on Front Street in a boxcar, the six um, Mexican male boarders that are aged 19 to 30, all working as laborers on the railroad. And Anna's work is listed as none. And can you imagine cooking, cleaning, washing, 
Um, for seven men and three children with more to follow and all of that with no electricity and no running water. She spoke only Spanish, so she most likely had no female friends. In the next photo, we'll see an article that appeared in the Muscatine News Tribune um, telling about young boys, and this was in 1909. And so most likely this story is about Anna, but we don't know for sure. But young boys were harassing a Mexican woman who was following her native custom and doing laundry in the river every Monday and then hanging it near the riverbank to dry. And these young boys would go down after she had left while her laundry was drying and they would drag her clean laundry in the dirt, tie it in knots, you know, doing things to kind of harass her. So we know that her life wasn't easy. In the next photo, we'll see another picture of Iowa. And by 1920, a lot more of the men who had come to work on the railroad had settled in. They had their wives and families with them now. And this 1920 um, census in Muscatine, there's one family with children, three married couples, six households, of Mexican men that have married um, US women, and there are five single male boarders. So the population in Muscatine of um, Mexican immigrants had doubled. And there were other households in Fruitland, Grandview, Sweetland, West Liberty, and other communities all along the Rock Island line. In the next photo, we'll see that the Sanchez's though their family had grown to a dozen by 1920 and they had moved to Medora, Kansas uh, to escape some legal difficulties that Juan was involved in. And they're still living on the Rock Island line and Juan is still working. They're still in a box car and it's in the right of way of the railroad. So by 1920, there are 12 in the family, and it's still a lot of work. In the next photo, um, here's a picture of Sebastiana at the age of 80 in Oklahoma, where she eventually settled. And I am writing about Anna we think she's the first Mexican woman to have lived in Muscatine for several years. And when families immigrate, it's often the women who are the backbone of the family unit and the tight knit ethnic neighborhoods. And in the past, it usually was the women working behind the scenes as volunteers who kept churches, schools and community betterment projects going. So my final, um, article that I put in the newspaper and the person, the last person I studied here was Anna. And I'm dedicating that to um, this article to Anna Sanchez and all the hardworking mothers who persistently work to improve their family and our community, but receive very little recognition. Mothers and homemakers are unsung women of inspiration. Thank you, Jean, and thank you, Sharon, for introducing us to these amazing women from Muscatine. Their stories are an important and interesting part of our local history, and we recognize the challenges they faced in their lifetime. They became role models for many future generations. I'd also like to thank Discover Muscatine for publishing our monthly biographies, Thank you to the Muster Public Library for research assistance in sharing the Muscatine Journal newspaper archives. And in closing, our gratitude to Chris Anderson for the beautiful logo design and to Chad Bishop and the MCC Video Studio for their assistance and support for this project. Um, 
we will uh, conclude uh, with a previously recorded um, video with our closing thoughts from the writers who have um, helped with the Muscatine women of inspiration, influence and inspiration. And we thank you um, for your support and interest in our project. And remember, please vote. Thank you. So my name is Jean Clark, and I wrote about Susan Clark, Catherine, and Ana Sanchez. In general, my thoughts on writing about these women and reading about the other women that we wrote about, I had to think about how um, women really had limited rights back in the 1800s, early 1900s. And society's expectations of women were also limited in what they could or should be doing in society. And in particular, when I wrote about Susan, I was thinking about what courage and stamina it took for a 13 year old girl to integrate public schools and how her father must have encouraged her because she, he didn't wait for his son. He went ahead and with his daughter said, yes, you should be in that school. And so it was that um, unusual putting forth the daughter that surprised me. When I wrote about Catherine Miller, it was her life of activity. She was involved in so many different organizations and was just always advocating for a better world. And when I wrote about her, it made me think of the African proverb, if you think you are too small to make a difference, you haven't spent a night with a mosquito. Because Catherine was a gadfly, always pushing other women to do more and be more in our surroundings. And my final person I wrote about was Ana Sanchez. And for me, it was what a survivor. This is a woman who didn't have the access to wealth position that so many of our other women that we wrote about had or developed through their careers, through education. Anna didn't have those, but yet she persevered. She raised her family and, you know, it, it just amazed me that she could um, live here in Muscatine as the first Mexican American or first woman from Mexico to live here with a family and how isolating that must have been, but yet she persevered and um, raised her family and the strength and the courage that that also took. So those were kind of my, my reflections on, on this process. I, I've enjoyed the project immensely. Next, we will hear from Christine Conlon. My name is Christine Conlon, and I was fascinated to be writing about Myra Hershey, who was an extraordinary businesswoman, an extraordinary philanthropist. She never got married, but she lived life to the fullest. She donated a dormitory in California to UCLA. She donated hospitals. She owned the Hollywood Hotel. She lived life to the fullest, and we're all still benefiting from her generosity. I wrote about Willetta Strahan, Muscatine is so lucky to have a small college in town. Uh, it's an integral part of the community and we owe that to Willetta. There's no town and gown here. We're all participants in what's going on at what used to be called JC and now is called MCC. Willetta didn't marry either, but she was generous with her time and aspirations for the community, helping to start organizations. She's still affecting the way we live life in this town. And I wrote about Opal Tanner, strict. I was intimidated by Opal. She was the librarian down at Muster Library. She uh, ran a tight ship and she was also a very kind person. 
She's one of the reasons, if not the reason, that Muscatine does have such a great library. She didn't marry either. She lost her fiance when she was very young. She directed her energy into helping us all have a better community. We women can be married now. We can participate both in the home and in the community. Be something successful, not just as a wife and mother, but also as a person who donates to everyone else. And we can vote. We were inspired and influenced by these women. And we should all really make sure that they are proud of us. And now, here's Cindy Cowes. Hello, I'm Cindy Coutts, and I want to make a couple remarks about this important year. 2020 marks the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote. As our committee researched Muscatine women, I reflected on how one individual can contribute to the greater good, not always in big ways, but also smaller, quiet actions. Our country has recently elected the first woman vice president of the United States. Kamala Harris is well qualified and is also a woman of color born to immigrant parents. It has taken 100 years to achieve this historic event. Hard won, not done. And next is Sharon Savage. Hi, I'm Sharon Savage. And I wrote about the Bromworth family. Uh, the Bromworth family was a very supportive family in this community at a time when higher education was not encouraged for females. Three of the daughters became physicians. One was a pharmacist and one a school principal. Uh, these were not children from a wealthy family. Uh, the father was an immigrant and he owned a shoe store in downtown Muscatine. Yet the parents encouraged and supported their female children as well as their male child. Uh, the physicians, especially the eldest one, J. Sarah Bronworth, uh, was ridiculed and insulted in the me medical journals. It was felt that women should not be physicians. It was a time when it was felt that a woman's place was in the home. Uh, it was the support of the family, I believe, that allowed these ladies to pursue their goals, regardless of the biases of the society in which they lived. So uh, what I concluded from the Bronworth family was a supportive family can make a tremendous difference in life. Uh, the second uh, lady that I wrote about was Cora Weed. And Cora Weed is a lady who suffered a great deal in her life. Although she was married to a wealthy businessman in Muscatine, he committed suicide while in their home, uh, I think shortly into the second year of their marriage. Prior to that, Cora had lost her first child in infancy. So Cora suffered a great deal of loss uh, very rapidly in her young married life. Cora was able to survive this loss by redirecting her goals and her attention and efforts to a, in a variety of meaningful ways, ranging from assisting in the passage of child labor laws uh, in Iowa to the formation and support of just many community organizations and participation in the arts. Uh, she was a great example of how the redirection of goals and efforts can create new purpose in life in the wake of sorrow and loss. Uh, and the next uh, person to speak will be Sandy Stanley. Thank you, I'm Sandy Stanley. And, okay, was that a feedback or something? I'm Sandy Stanley and I wrote about Helen Bamford. She was the first woman in Iowa to have her own photog photography studio. Definitely a woman ahead of her time. She never married, but I can imagine she was a strong woman, private and dedicated to her profession. I would have liked to have met her. I have a quote now from Jane Adams, who's from Illinois, our neighbor. Um, Jane Adams was a social worker. She was also the winner of the Nobel Prize in 1931. And here is her quote. I do not believe that women are better than men. We have not wrecked nor corrupted legislature nor done many unholy things that men have done. But then we must remember that we have not had the chance. Now, Mary Wildermuth is the next person to talk. Hello, my name is Mary Wildermuth and I researched two women 
uh, one being Pearl McGill, who was a young girl in the button industry, the Pearl button industry for which Muscatine is famous. And Pearl's significant role was a, as a writer in the beginning because she uh, was the secretary to the labor union. But eventually she was able to go out into the world to New York and other places. And what she did in those places was organize individuals so that workers' rights uh, were protected um, versus what they had been previously. Then along comes um, um, Anna Opel, who um, lives in Muscatine all of her life. She owns several different restaurants, but her real, real uh, goal or her real um, thing that she was known for is her um, love of wildflowers. And so whenever she could, she spoke to women's groups or church groups or showed people the wildflowers in the area. And for this, she becomes known across the state of Iowa. And she's also a writer because she has her own um, article in the newspaper, plus she has her own program on the television and on the radio. So as you can see, all of these women that we've talked about this past year and in these, this video series have been women who uh, follow what Helen Reddy said back in the 70s. She said, you know, I am woman, hear me roar. And so we all have roared in our own individual ways. And in a way, the women that are presenting here today are roaring because we're roaring in a different way. This is 2020. And as you may know, or you may not know, uh, the pandemic COVID uh, crisis um, has impacted us all from uh, March. This is now December. So we sit here at home recording this series so that you can learn into the future. So we'll hope you'll be inspired by these women that we've spoken about. Thank you very much.